Good morning, everybody. My name is Ongam Dimka. I'm a lecturer at the Department of History and Political Studies at Nelson Mandela University, and I have a great honor this morning to moderate this session that's going to be exciting in this conference, The State We Are In, Democracies, Fractures, Fixes, and Futures. It's a great opportunity uh, to, and an honor, in fact, to have these leading scholars that are going to be joining the session and presenting this morning. And I hope that you are going to participate. Grateful to Kenrad and the university for organizing such a fantastic conference. There's great speeches. Uh, and we'll get started right away. And I'm going to go according to the order of the appearance of the abstracts in the conference pack. First up, we've got, a, in fact, the, conf the, the symposium itself, just in case you think you're lost, is Policies and Party Politics in South Africa, uh, Ethiopia, and Uganda. So we're going to be looking into that. And the first speaker is my own head of department, Dr. Nsikelelo Breakfast. And he's going to be looking at the nexus between conflict management and coalition politics in three selected metropolitan municipalities in South Africa. He is a prolific writer, he's a sharp scholar, uh, appears very often on our television and radio airwaves. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, uh, Dr. Nsikelelo Breakfast. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mdimka. Um, good morning to everyone. Um, so the, the paper basically uh, examines the, the weaknesses of, of power sharing. Um, within the context of local government um, by offering a conflict management mechanism, you know, covering the period of 2016 until uh, to date. Now, there seems to be <clears throat> a missing link, you know, between power sharing and uh, some, pr some provisions of uh, conflict management meaning that there is a, a knowledge gap between coalition and uh, conflict management. My, my, my central thesis um, for this presentation is that the, the political elite have a tendency to, to rush into joining forces by forming these uh, coalition arrangements without developing a conflict management mechanism to deal with their own internal contradictions. Now, according to the work of uh, Andre Limfant, uh, power sharing refers to politics of accommodation. Um, it is meant to protect the, the interest of uh, minority groups and I want to argue that uh, there are strong points and weaknesses of power sharing. One of the strong points of power sharing is that when you have power sharing, you are able to take on board all the political party um, that you have entered into uh, agreement with. Meaning that there is no political party that imposes its agenda on uh, society. The other advantage is that power sharing limits the abuse of power because power tends to be uh, diffused to all the, the stakeholders. Uh, um, on the other hand though, there are weaknesses of uh, power sharing. One of them is that every now and then there is a, a deadlock. Now, if, for instance, you have a deadlock on matters of budget, let's say there is a, a disagreement that uh, breaks out, uh, political parties cannot agree on the budget, that becomes counterproductive because it means that services will not be rendered. Uh, because the issue of budget, in particular, at local government level, is linked to uh, the IDP and the baby of the IDP, which is the, uh, the LED. 
Now, the the conception of power sharing um, is 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 drawn from international best practices. Um, it comes from countries like uh, Holland, Germany, Greece, um, and so on. Just to mention a, a few. However, it must be noted that there have been uh, power sharing arrangements on the African continent um, in post-colonial uh, states. Now, drawing uh, extensively from the work of uh, David Welsh, South Africa doesn't have a, a, a long-standing history of uh, power sharing. The, the first coalition uh, formation um, that we had was in the early 1900s. Uh, to be more specific, it was in 1924 um, between the National Party and the Labour Party. The second one was uh, in 1933 between um, the, the National Party and the South African Party. And subsequent to that, uh, the political landscape was dominated by the National Party until the ANC rose to prominence in 1994 and then became a hegemonic until uh, the early uh, 2000. And then, of course, as you know, colleagues, uh, you know as well as I do that uh, it was dealt with a blow um, in, in, in uh, 2016. Now, the interesting thing about the 2016 election is that the 2016 election illustrated that uh, one party dominance is a thing of the past uh, because the, the support of the ANC shrunk. Um, according to uh, the IEC, the ANC in uh, 2016 on the whole, or by and large, um, it stood at 53% compared to 66% uh, that uh, it received in 2011. So you can see that uh, it has had a downward uh, electoral uh, trajectory. And, 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 and this shows that the ANC also, uh, it's, percentage uh, might, might be below 50% uh, in the coming uh, elections um, at local government uh, level. Now, what is interesting is that um, in the 2016 uh, election, the ANC lost three metropolitan municipalities. Um, and this begs the question, it begs the question as to why did the ANC lose in the main uh, urban centers as opposed to municipalities in rural areas? And in trying to grapple with this question or in trying to tackle this uh, question, I draw from the seminal work of uh, Mahmoud Mamdan, uh, namely citizen and subject. In his work, Mamdan introduces us to the concept of a bifurcated state. By a bifurcation, um, Mamdan is talking about the divide between the rural and the urban uh, spaces. And Mamdan argues that the legacy of colonialism, of decentralized uh, despotism, um, is basically found in rural areas whereby uh, traditional leaders uh, are influencing the political behavior of the electorate. So all in all, what Mamdan says is that um, traditional leaders are on the payroll of uh, governments which are, uh, are controlled you know, by a, a liberation uh, a movements. And in return, they bring the, the votes. 
No wonder the the electoral uh, base of the ANC has not been affected, um, uh, despite the fact that the, the, the ANC has not been uh, doing well um, in other urban uh, centers. Now, liberation movements, uh, they are political longevity or the political lifespan of uh, liberation movements, it tends to be extended, uh, meaning that political behavior is not something that changes overnight. Um, and this is, you know, uh, the case also in other neighboring states, namely in Zimbabwe, Namibia, Botswana, um, Algeria, and so on. I'm mentioning those countries which are still governed by uh, liberation uh, movements. Now, it must be noted that uh, people don't vote for liberation movements because of their good track record of service uh, delivery. Uh, liberation movements, according to uh, Christopher Klemham, the, 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 the greatest advantage of liberation movements is their collective memory. That's why the ANC doesn't want to let go of this uh, description of being called a liberation movement because they benefit out of that. Um, because you can't call yourself um, a, a, a liberation movement while you have ascended to power via electoral means, but they benefit out of that currency of uh, calling themselves um, a, a liberation uh, movement. The, the other issue that uh, I want to draw your attention to is the notion of nativism and how it is used by liberation movements uh, in pursuit of their agenda to benefit in the main the political elite and by nativism i'm talking about a, a form of populism that rose to prominence in the second half of the 20th uh, century uh, which is meant to to maintain political power to to benefit uh, the political elite by exploiting the historical factors uh, by basically putting the blame um, on the West not to say that the the, 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 the the West must not be criticized for other things that um, uh, it has done. But the issue is that nativism, uh, as uh, uh, Franz Fanon um, puts it, is an ideology which is used by um, uh, the political elite uh, to maintain political power uh, for, for themselves. So that is the psychology of uh, liberation movements, a psychology of uh, accumulation. Again, Franz Fanon argues that um, the, the national liberation movements, normally when they come to power, they come to power as, a, as an unprepared class that doesn't have uh, economic policies um, and, and fails to promote development for uh, the majority. He goes on to say that uh, this unprepared political class uh, tends to become a comrato, a comrato class that is used uh, as a proxy by the international bourgeoisie. So I think that uh, historical background is very important in terms of understanding the the electoral trends in our country and uh, the 
the electoral uh, behavior and also explains why um, the ANC has been doing well in rural areas, but doing the exact opposite in urban uh, centers. Now, because of time, colleagues, I'm not going to bore you with some uh, details of what has been happening uh, specifically in, 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 in these uh, metropolitan municipalities, which uh, I'm covering uh, in, in, in my paper. But I will uh, propose the, the, the conflict management uh, mechanism uh, model um, that 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 I think is a solution to um, uh, the contradictions which are, are at play. So uh, I'm proposing a a a, a model from uh, Ronald Fisher and uh, William Yuri. It's called uh, an integrative approach of conflict. Um, uh, it's a win-win uh, approach. Uh, that is being uh, recommended here by uh, Ronald Fisher and William Urey, that when there is a problem, political parties, they need to hit the problem hard and be soft on uh, each other. Uh, that uh, politics should not be seen as, as a zero-sum game and that uh, compromises should be made when there are stalemates. Yeah, without any further ado, uh, I'll hand over to you, uh, Mr. Mtimkase. Uh, thank you, Dr. Breakfast. Uh, great input. Um, I think covering a nice range of the historical uh, uh, development uses of coalition politics around the world. It was good also to highlight uh, the South African example. Um, and I think that uh, uh, it's a pity we, we missed your core, core, core submission on that last part in terms of, you know, what's, what's it. But obviously, we can always read the paper. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, for that input. That was Dr. Nsegelelo Breakfast looking into the nexus between conflict management and coalition politics in three selected metropolitan municipalities in South Africa. And next up, we are going to have another prolific uh, scholar, uh, party politics in Ethiopia, coalition and fragmentation in opposition parties since 2005. A very interesting abstract that looks into uh, some of what's happened with issues ranging from uh, ethnic politics to um, other issues. I think that were highlighted impediments to coalition politics. Let's welcome Solomon Tefera. Solomon, your volume, your, your volume is low, and I hope that you and the technical team can help us. Um, if you can maybe come closer to your mic. Okay. Uh, uh, now let's, uh, let me start uh, the presentation. Uh, part politics in Ethiopia, uh, coalition and fragmentation in the opposition political parties uh, since 2005. Uh, in Ethiopia, uh, there are different uh, political parties uh, currently, uh, but the emergency of Ethiopian political parties uh, is traced back to 1965. Did you hear? No. You can hear you loud and clear. Thanks. No. Yes, we can hear you, Solomon. Please proceed. Okay. Uh, the rise of political parties in Ethiopia is uh, traced back to 1916. Uh, at this time, there are different political parties emerged. Uh, those political parties uh, is uh, rebellion political parties because. At that time, the, the, the uh, legal political parties or the movement political parties not allowed 
uh, because of this, uh, those political parties uh, merging in the, the rebellion forms. For example, uh, those political parties, OLF, Oromo Liberation Front, these parties currently, it's a females or have, have, have different millions of support from Oromo regions. Another is TPLF, Tigray Liberation Front, uh, Ikeba National Liberation Front, and Somali Liberation Front. Those political party is Ifro nationalist political parties, or those political parties I believe uh, there was oppression in Ethiopia. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, the solution for political oppression or the solution for the pro political problem is must be all uh, Ethiopians uh, organized themselves on ethnic lines, and those political parties were strongly supported by uh, Sudan. Uh, Somali, Yemen, and other uh, Arab states. Uh, therefore, uh, those political parties sometimes is, is what we call is sub parties political parties. Uh, again, again, uh, the, the German student movement uh, is, 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 is set back uh, or uh, the brain source for, for, for the establishment of a, a political party in Ethiopia. Uh, there are especially two political parties is directly uh, born from uh, Ethiopian student movement. Those are, uh, for example, we can uh, Ethiopian uh, People Liberation Front, and another is OLF, TPLF. Those political parties were directly born from Ethiopian student movement, or in other words, uh, the Ethiopian student movement, that what we call is uh, the time is, is at the Southern University. And that is, at that time, uh, the movement of Ethiopian student movement is, is set down for establishment of uh, political parties, as well as for the first time, it's a pinnacle for the fragmentation of Ethiopian political parties. Uh, especially at that time, there were a fragmentation is happening between Ethiopian student movements. Those are Ethio nationalism and pro Ethiopianism. Uh, especially, Ethio nationalism is argued uh, there were uh, ethnic, ethnic oppression, or uh, especially Oromos, Gurage, uh, Walaitas, those were oppressed by Amara uh, class. And another is a pro Ethiopianism argues that there were no ethnic oppression. That's why it's directly against the Ethiopian nationalism. Therefore, Ethiopian nationalism and pro Ethiopianism have uh, opposite arguments. Uh, another is Ethiopian nationalism, uh, especially uh, the Ethiopian nationalism represented by, as you know, uh, Tigray Liberation Front, uh, Ertra Liberation Front, OLF, uh, the pro Ethiopianism is were supported by Ethiopian People Liberation Front, Mesot, or all Ethiopian socialist movements, especially uh, the Ethiopian People, people uh, Revolution Front is strongly uh, supported from the Tigray regions and Amara regions. Another is the Mesot and the, the member of Mesot were uh, most of the is Oromo. Uh, another is some uh, the friends that what we call is the so the, the friends group. Another is the fragmentation of the fragmentation that started in 1965 is continued until 1991, uh, especially in the post 1991 period to reduce the divisions among Ethiopian political parties. Uh, different, different, different mechanisms attempted, especially uh, by forming a uh, coalitions. As you know, in African, in South Africa, uh, the party coalition is, is will, will contributed for the end of uh, uh, the apartheid systems, as well as uh, in in the most of African states, the coalition uh, among political parties is help us a bridge to for for the national dialogue or negotiations. But in Ethiopian context, it's still it's impossible to to, to reduce the, divi the the division or the fragmentation among political parties. Anyway, in nineteen in post nineteen ninety one, 
at the different times, uh, party fragmentation, part, party coalition attempts. For example, we can take uh, CUD or Coalition for Democracy. It's, we, we were at uh, form party coalition for 1995 uh, Ethiopian election. But But those fragmentation, but those coalition is, is soon fragmented, or it's impossible to, to establish a strong party coalition that contributes for democratic transition in Ethiopia. Uh, because those parties is soon fragmented after 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 forming uh, party coalition. For example, we can take. Uh, the Coalition for Ethiopia Democratic Force, the, U the United Ethiopia Democratic Force, the Coalition for Unity and Democratic CUD, the Ethiopian Federal Democratic Unity, or, or what we call is in Amharic, Madarak, where a prominent opposition party that were formed party coalition to, to, to uh, uh, against or to, to, to compete with a ruling party, the, the former ruling party is EPRDF, uh, but those parties is uh, were soon fragmented. Uh, therefore, uh, as, 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 as above mentioned, all parties fragmented. For example, Menelik is the, for, 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 for today is exists for, for sake of name, but it's, it's impossible uh, that the survival of the, 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 the coalition of uh, Merak, because from the Merak, different political parties were also withdraw. For example, uh, Unity for Justice, or in Amharic, what we call is Andinet, Somali Democratic Alliance Force. Uh, those political parties is withdraw or isolated themselves from Merak coalitions. Therefore, it's impossible to think, uh, or it's impossible to uh, say. The existence of uh, party coalition exists in Ethiopia, but all those those, those coalition is, is fragmented in soon. Uh, now, this paper is is analyze why those political parties fragmented, or why uh, it's impossible to establish sustainable or a strong party coalition in Ethiopian uh, context. Uh, at different times, different Ethiopian scholars attempt to address or to, 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 to examine uh, why uh, why the Ethiopian political parties fragmented or why Ethiopian political parties agreed on on the common issues because Ethiopians have only uh, one common goal. Those common goal is to establish sustainable or strong Ethiopians that. Uh, Democratic states. Anyway, uh, this paper is address of all focus of the states examine the challenge of political parties, coalition, driving factors, and the cause of fragmentation uh, by focusing on on purposes selected for this studies. Uh, attempt or attempt to address uh, by 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 focusing on on three political parties. One is CUD or coalition for Democracy in Ethiopia, United Ethiopia Democratic Parties, or in Madarak. Uh, those political parties is take as, as, as case studies to examine uh, why the Ethiopian political parties formed the party coalition and why Ethiopian political parties fragmented or the cause of fragmentation uh, among political Ethiopian political parties. Uh, since 2005, Ethiopian opposition political parties have made a pre uh, uh, election uh, political uh, coalition, especially for seeing political power. Uh, from the nature in most parliamentary systems, in order to form a government, uh, it's necessary to form a party coalition, uh, secure 50% uh, uh, plus one. Uh, all uh, opposition political parties form is a party coalition. Uh, in view of that, the three Ethiopian prominent, uh, prominent Opposition political parties had formed uh, party coalitions since 2005. Those coalitions for unity and democracy, Ethiopian Federal Democratic Unity Forum, United Ethiopian Democratic Force 
or feuds. Those are the more prominent parties that form the political party coalition. Another is a three political parties, CUD and AUD, had formed the party coalition for 2005 the general elections. Those parties were actively in terms of recreating the parties or challenging the ruling, ruling parties. Uh, another is uh, hybrid Ethiopian political parties, especially characterized by short lived party coalitions. Uh, Ethiopian political parties formed party coalitions, but uh, soon fragmented uh, because of internal and external powerful factors. For instance, PEB and the EB, the coalition for, were a part that formed uh, party coalitions after 2005 for Ethiopian general elections. Uh, other is after 2000, Ethiopian five general elections, Ethiopian Central Democratic Unity Forum was formed in 2009 uh, by the composition of eight political parties. That has been reestablished the forum in 2010 by four political parties. Those are uh, Oromo Federal Democratic Movement, Somali Democratic Alliance Forum, the United of Tigray for Democracy and the Sovereign Parties. Uh, those parties formed in 2009 uh, for, to, to run for election. For instance, the United for Democracy and Justice, Somali Democratic Alliance Forum withdrawn from the coalition, coalition due to fragmentation among the opposition political parties, the establishment of strong opposition political parties coalition that could contribute transforming uh, the state into democratic, democratization remains an ideal scenario. Uh, however, no major attempts have been made to examine a party coalition and a fragmentation in the post-2005 in political history of Ethiopia. In this regard, the party coalition and fragmentation in Ethiopian opposition parties is a need empirical instead to examine a driving factor for forming a coalition and a, a fragmentation among selected political parties. With regard to this, the most existing literature were emphasized on the types of opposition political parties before 2005. Along with this, the area of emphasis assessing to overall states of opposition party in Ethiopia, the reason does hinder the either to win a sufficient seat, why or those opposition political parties replaced in the Ethiopian parties. The most of the researchers focus on these areas, but overlooked the reason why the Ethiopian political party is fragmented. Thank and you. Th th thank you, sir. So let's hope that in the Q&A, you'll have an opportunity to wrap up that remaining part in the presentation. But uh, thank you for painting a good picture, a, 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 a picture of the coalition environment in Ethiopia which is uh, useful for understanding and advancing knowledge within the politics discipline. That was uh, Solomon uh, Te Tefera from Ambo University in Ethiopia. We are moving right along. Uh, the next speaker is Ivan Mungulusi from St. Louis University in the US and is talking about citizenship, monarchism uh, from below constructing citizenship in Uganda. Uh, thank you, you may proceed, Evan. Um, good morning, everyone. In this paper, I examine work on identity construction um, and its relationship to citizens. Um, this is both generally and specifically in relation to Uganda. I discuss interviews I conducted with the Ugandan opposition on which um, this, this work is premised and present the findings. Uh, there are mainly two questions that I try to answer. Um, one looks at how opposition groups help individuals construct new identities um, as citizens empowered to, to act in order to, to gain their support. The second question uh, looks at how activists form horizontal bonds with themselves in, in an umbrella to act as one with, with one singular voice. And the reason I thought about writing this paper was because there is a lot of research on repressive regimes that tends to focus on groups that already have some sort of um, success. So I thought 
um, attention should be given to how individual groups start to form. I am of the view that earlier stages of identity construction are critical to understanding how opposition movements emerge, even in very unlikely circumstances. And I argue, um, I argue that uh, large protests in oppressive regimes uh, do not just occur as a result of a sudden shift in political circumstances. When we think about things that have happened like in, in the in the Arab Spring, things that have happened in Russia, having these large groups of people coming up to protest. Um, my view is that this is an end product of a much longer process of the opposition preparing citizens to act through small things like voting, in, inviting them to participate in in the struggle, things that help them forge this sort of identity that allows them to challenge the status quo and and of course being a citizen i feel is one aspect of identity that's highly relevant to collective action this is this it's it's liable to change meaning of course um during that heated interaction between a regime and the state um it's because citizens for example citizens from below for example, is a self a self definition. It it rejects it rejects the one that that one definition that's def, that's provided by the state. Um, ideally, on a strict level, legal level, we are either legal citizens, we are either legal citizens, or we are not in countries that we reside. But this meaning is not stable across time. Um, it has embodied meanings as diverse as small groups starting to make claims. Um, the most vivid example, I, I know very first lecture that um, Professor Mamdan gave, he talked about how how Steve, Steve, Steve Biko came up with the idea of black consciousness that so people of different, different, different identities coming up together to say, well, I think we have a cause um, and the, the things that we think we can do together. So these elements are what form, these elements are what form the basis for claims against, against the government. Because as people interact, they start to figure out who they are, they start to figure out what they stand for and how they are willing to act as this struggle continues. I think you should move to um, the slide, slide six. Uh, yes, so that's, um, that's where I'm getting at. So now, in a perfect democracy, I, the identity of citizens can be a starting point to make collective claims about things like equal rights, um, uh, people can always demand accountability in a perfect democracy, but in a repressive regime, um, a place like Uganda, for example, where historical precedents and cultural expectations work against um, active political participation, the process becomes very difficult. This is because people are forging um, this sort of identity that the regime would rather they did not have. But I, my, my claim here is that that the very difficult process is a very necessary state um, to starting to form this sort of identity. Let's move to the next one. To, to try to understand what activists do, I rely on intensive interviews and ethnographic methods. Um, by speaking with these respondents, uh, it was a total of over 43. Uh, it was a very small sample. By speaking with activists, I identify various messages they employ to define their own purpose and, and how they convince others to join them. Well, of course, these interviews were able to provide insight into how the opposition groups recruited supporters. Um, there were limitations to that methodolog methodological approach. For instance, um, in trying to learn how they tried to convince um, their would-be followers, to be engaged to, to gain that support for their group, I asked 
my respondents how I asked them whether they employed arguments of citizenship, whether they started to ask things like, oh, do you have a connection with X, Y, Z? So you've, we have an identity to be engaged with us. Now, and, and I received general answers which did not give me substance, so which I took as an indication that my language did not well capture the intentions of the activist. So instead of direct questions of this nature, I rely on I relied on more general explanations of what groups do, how they communicate with the broader public. And the other thing was the sample was so small. I did think that uh, when I, when I, whenever I tried to engage the respondents, there was fear that probably worked with the regime, which, which fear is very understandable. I also relied on informants through uh, people I was talking to. They always talked to somebody to identify whoever would be able to give me information. Now, of course, to account for this possible bias resulting from the selection, I also used my own observation on the events that have taken place across time between 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020. And suddenly it helped me give me a broader picture of, of what I was looking for. Uh, can you move to the next slide? And I found that the opposition in Uganda think that being involved in collective action is not Uganda's strong suit. Activists have identified things like apathy. People ideally feel like there's no reason to be involved in the in electoral process. They identified obedience, fear. Um, and there's also the idea that people do not want to be part of civil society organizations now and of course they all most activists agree that the political circumstances they inhabit they encourage this sort of situation and therefore they think that work is needed to convince ordinary Ugandans to be politically engaged and one major locus one thing they all agreed about was participation in in elections they they saw elections as a time when people are highly likely to change their political behaviors and interests. So uh, these are sort of, the, these are the interviews I quote here, kind of like give you a picture of what, what I was able to read. So some of them saw these elections as a chance to show Ugandans how elections are manipulated and there are also groups that saw these elections as instruments. Oh, they saw demonstrations as instruments for influencing the regime, especially where elections were not able to provide remedies to what they are looking for. Let's move to the next one, please. Yeah, and and of course, delusion with this sort of uncompetitive nature of elections meant that activists found ways to to express their rejection um, one direct way was calling attention to the oppressive nature of the regime um, some wore bulletproof vests and they reported that and they also took on to use uh, monstrations and music events to sort of gain this support, to gain this support and be actively involved, which accordingly brought so many people under, under that banner of ending the regime. Now, of course, as expected, um, these people found ways to reject um, these, these because when you think about a repressive regime, they, what they want is that you are you are docile. You do not you're not allowed to challenge the status quo. But th these activities of um, 
of the opposition allowed these people to reject these roles the state is prescribing for them. Let's move to the next slide. I, so I also found that many respondents hoped to lay a foundation for more engaged citizenry. Um, there was the thought that at least they needed to be to do things that were dear to people, um, things that suddenly, things that had to do with as basic as education, things that were as basic as handling corruption, so that people feel that they had a shared cause and related to, to, to them. Now, and, and for the most part, they became in, involved into this sort of grassroots, this sort of grassroots politics. And going over it, it's while there was not a nationwide, a nationwide protest, um, these things did suggest that there was active um, political involvement. Um, we we did experience protests that at least had to that sparked a nation that that sparked across the borders. Um, we had we gained international attention. So that brings down comes down to my idea that this very very small small actions lead to a situation where people start to rise and start to recognize that they they find a space they find identity and we move to the next one yeah which brings me to um, my conclusion that that activists ideally see a variety of political activities as critical to, to, to locating identity and helping people to shift their view when, when in times of contention. I see that I've run out of time. You can conclude, we still have 50 minutes. Um, Ivan, I did say you can make your concluding remarks. You still had oh. 50 minutes when you stopped. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch that. Yeah, so, so I do think that um, the, that these very small tentative activities that, um, that the opposition and activists promote um, do create a space where, where individuals start to feel that there's that shared identity that helps promote a movement that in a way transcends to push back on, on the regime. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you for sticking to the time there. Um, and uh, he was presenting on um, citizenship, Mwananchism yes, from below, construction, or oh, sort of constructing citizenship in Uganda. So last but not least, we've moved from the nature of political systems focusing mainly on coalition governments. We've looked at, uh, at two presentations in that. We've gone to um, the sort of polit political sociological um, approach, looking into citizenship. And then we move into the realm of policy analysis with a presentation coming at a crucial time in South Africa and debates about uh, social security, uh, basic income grants, among other things. So we've got Professor Pagaman Jongwana from Nelson Mandela University, and she'll be focusing on social security provision for lone mothers in South Africa, independence, dependency, and dignity.
Let us welcome uh, Prof. Uh, Pakaman Jongwana. Colleagues. Um, so um, my presentation is on Ubuntu, dignity, and the structural underclass. So, okay, thanks. So basically I look at um, so social security provision for um, women with low income and start with um, the state maintenance grant before the onset of democracy and then the, the introduction of the child support grant, um, the first years of the uh, child support grant under democracy um, and um, then when the card system, a biometrics card system was um, introduced um, in order to apply for the child support grant. And then I look at social um, assistance for these women um, under the um, pandemic. Um, so, um, I, in, in doing so, I, I synthesize research evidence um, from a study uh, on whether, which was my study, on whether the child support uh, grant engenders a culture of dependency and in so do erodes dignity. Um, um, of course, bearing in mind that um, the, it, it's, it's, a, it's a stipulation um, in the constitution to provide social security provision um, for uh, people who need it. And also in the Bill of Rights, it, 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 it stipulated that um, government should as much as possible uh, promote and protect uh, the dignity of citizens. So I look at whether the child support grant leads to a sense of independence uh, or autonomy, and in, in actual fact, does protect dignity or not? And then I explore the role of the child uh, of, 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 of the social relief of distress in combination with the child support grant um, under um, the, the pandemic. Um, next slide, please. So despite the absence of direct uh, social assistance cover for unemployed people of working age, um, um, still um, in media and in parliament, there are concerns that the child support grant is in fact a disincentive uh, to unemployed um, mothers to work. Part of the study Therefore, is, is, is part of the aim of the study is to obtain evidence about whether such disincentive in fact exists. Um, so I explore views of South African citizens on pa paid work, uh, the social grant system, and the relationship between grants and paid work. I look at the relationship between poverty and dignity, uh, child care and work, and my chosen theoretical uh, framework uh, resonates with uh, the stigma observed um, in, 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 in media discourse uh, and some view of policymakers and uh, members of uh, communities in which uh, respondents live. A, a, a lot of the time, the child support grant is associated with teenage pregnancy and promiscuity. Next slide, please. So the, the views that um, just general discourse in the country resonates with um, the dependency culture thesis, which is based on conservative views um, on communities in, research, in, in, in receipt of benefits um, in, in, in countries like the UK and, 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 and the US, so basically in the West. So 
Under this dependency culture thesis, adults are seen to have little or no attachment to the labor market. Um, paid work is not valued. Individuals are seen to be content in the long term to derive their income from state transfers. So then a culture of dependency is seen to be transmitted intergenerationally. And it is hypothesized that children see no working role models and observe a contented reliance on state transfers and so inherit a tendency of dependency. So people perceived to be exhibit um, people perceived uh, to be exhibiting this um, dependency culture are uh, said to be a, a moral underclass because it, 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 it focuses on the behavior of um, the social grant recipients. So looking at the structural um, underclass, um, which is the work of um, Wilson in the late 1980s and in South Africa seekings uh, in uh, the early 2000s, this counter argument to the dependent thesis um, is based on structural, economic and spatial dynamics that lock people into long-term unemployment and a desp despondent look on the life that um, may on the on life that may adversely affect their behavior. Um, so that the, the, the structural underclass um, thesis asserts that social security provision does not engender passivity or a culture of de dependency, but provides much support. Both the quantitative and the qualitative research findings in the study demonstrate that we do indeed have a structural underclass um, in South Africa, living far from economic hubs uh, with low skills and unemployed. And the labor force survey and the general uh, household survey has quite fine grained information um, on this. So I then, um, a theory synthesis of the structural underclass with that of Ubuntu. In doing so, I seek to achieve a conceptual integration of these two streams and offer an enhanced view on social security provision for lone mothers with low income by linking previously unconnected concepts. It is of course agreed that the apartheid legacy bequeathed an underclass to South Africa. However, I argue that our social policies ought to go further than the epistemolog epistemological awareness of structural constraints and people's coping mechanisms in a given place under specific conditions. So I look at, I, 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 I draw from Prof Ramusa's work and do a, a linguistic analysis of Ubuntu. So the prefix Ubu evokes the idea of being and is distinctly ontological. Uh, the stem do assumes concrete form or a mode of being and is epistemological. So respondents were asked whether social security provision is a form of Ubuntu and most respondents said it is. However, humiliation experienced when applying for the child support grant
um, respondents um, related experiences where officials would um, stigmatize them for having different fathers for their children, for example. Um, or they would say things like, um, meaning that in order to be eligible for the grant, one has to open their legs, basically. Also stigma in communities, um, because there are dates um, in the month, two, particularly two days in the month, when uh, uh, people would go to um, access their grants and do groceries and coming back home, the communities would see this and, and, and derogatory statement um, would be uttered. And of course, that speaks to uh, the fact that the, the, the child support grant is means tested um, and not universal as such to deal with that aspect of stigma. And also it, it costs much more for um, government to apply a means test to, 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 to child support grant receipt that the, rather than make it universal. Uh, and uh, some women also said the parsimonious nature of the grant just undermines the gesture of um, Ubuntu. So I basically argue that evidence informed policies are not adequate as they're just based on hard facts and knowledge that who is eligible for the grant, who is not eligible for the grant, and, and um, it's it, 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 a more wholesome approach or more holistic approach that would include um, our own way of being, um, which where empathy is intrinsic, like umtu, gumuntu, gabantu. This question was also asked in, in elite interviews with uh, two policymakers whether, in, in drawing up policies, Ubuntu was at all a consideration. Um, and the response was in the negative. So, if our way of being and Ubuntu in this sense would be integrated. Um, into policy making, going further than um, structural uh, uh, structural um, constraints, um, hard facts. I argue that there would be more acceptance um, that the, the child support grant and that the culture of dependency and that people in receipt of the child support grant have attachment to the labor market, they have dreams of their own for their own families, that the 440 a month can never be enough uh, to raise a child um, or be something to, uh, to, to rec recklessly aspire to um, or, be con or, or, or people just, just be content receiving that, that grant. So I use a mixed methods approach in the research, both qualitative and quantitative um, focus groups, uh, semi-structured um, uh, uh, focus groups in um, rural and um, peri-urban townships. Um, and I also have in-depth um, interviews with uh, um, recipients of the child support grant and um, two elite in-depth interviews um, with policymakers. So I'll just, uh, I won't read all these questions, but these, this is, these are questions on the interview schedule um, for the focus groups and the in-depth interviews. Um, individual. 
so I look at challenges faced by lone mothers when in low paid work or when unemployed. Uh, some mothers um, spoke of having to um, be involved in trans transactional sex um, in order to feed their children and how this um, put their security at risk. Um, was there, I look at whether there was job loss experience during the pandemic um, and how were they, if, if, if so, how were day-to-day -day basic needs met? Um, because a considerable number of, of, of women in receipt of the child support grant also, of course, do work. Yeah, yeah, concluding remarks, Prof. As we've oh run my out of word. Time. Um, so the last question is on whether social security provision is, is perceived as an expression of Ubuntu. Um, and um, next next slide, please. I won't go. Um, if, if one is interested, I can send them the questions. Next slide, please. So I just want to look at the quantitative uh, 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 results that demonstrate that people are attached to the labor market. Uh, this speaks to... Um, why people uh, don't have jobs. So a considerable number of people um, r related struggles with um, no money for transport to go to work. Next slide, please. Um, okay, the previous slide was on, 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 on job seeking um, strategies and a lot of people before the pandemic went door to door uh, knocking, looking for work and, and taking whatever work they could do. Again, demonstrating a, a, an attachment to the labor market and also reasons for moving in the last five years before the pandemic um, the, with um, over 60% of people having, to, having moved to find work. Um, next slide, please. Oh, this is the micro simulation uh, component of the quantitative um, uh, 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 research and um, where I explore the impact of, of, of on two possible social security options, the basic in income grant and a reintroduction of the state maintenance grant, which was racially stratified during apartheid, but was not at all uh, stigmatized. And um, this was seen to, have, to reduce household poverty with children by 20%. I haven't done the basic income grant uh, simulation yet. Next slide, please. Uh, Prof, I, I think that let's, um, if, if you can say one major statement that summarizes your findings, and mm -hmm. then let's hope you have an opportunity during the Q&A to actually um, address uh, one or two more things that you may have wanted. Thanks. Yes, thank you. So basically, um, that poverty erodes dignity <laughs> and um, that, um, it, it, you know, th with the pandemic, um, the fiscus can take um, provision of a basic income grant for unemployed adults of working age. And this is a, a gesture of Ubuntu and a demonstration of Ubuntu, not only on the recipients of the social um, grants, but also on the part of the policymakers as South Africans. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That was uh, Professor Pagamanjongwana wrapping up the session uh, with a presentation that gives politics a human face, actually. So, the, yeah, we don't have, yeah, that's it. Yeah. So, giving politics a human face. The thing is, with uh, in a political economy analysis, policy is a dependent variable of the politics. So uh, it's quite interesting that in this session, we saw an environment in which you have, polit you have a political, uh, you have a, a political environment and its issues, and then uh, identity construction. And then lastly, the dependent variable of what happens to the, the outcomes of politics, if you like. Uh, I'm going to open for a Q&A. We have a little bit of time, so 
uh, we're going to keep it uh, very nice and short. Uh, I don't see any questions that are posted in the chat, and I don't know whether we've got, uh, you've attended as many sessions to see whether we've got a functionality for people to raise hands and actually uh, raise their questions uh, live. Prof. Chris, do you want to help me there? Are we, are we opening up for live as well? Live asking of questions? Hi, colleagues. Uh, unfortunately, the, the platform doesn't allow for that. So, uh, so it, it has to be in the, in the Q&A or the chat, please. Okay. So, uh, question first of all for you, Dr. Breakfast. Um, I, I'll keep the, the discussion going from my side. Um, until I see some questions. One interesting, you know, overview in terms of South Africa's experience with coalitions and also how political parties failed to manage conflict um, in those metropolitan municipalities. Are there any specific ways uh, in which, uh, you know, they could have done things differently from a conflict management perspective in order uh, uh, for them to 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 manage things better did you get to that level or were there any particular consequences of that failure to manage coalitions uh, that you could observe from your research okay cool sure yeah so um, i was saying that the, the challenge is that a lot of political parties they they see conflict as a zero sum game as a win lose uh, situation as opposed to a win win uh, situation. It's normal that uh, where there are human beings, problems are bound to um, occur. I mean, conflict is a natural uh, phenomenon, but what is important is to have ways and means of managing uh, conflict. Uh, as you know, uh, Mr. Mdimga, as a political scientist yourself, that there are two types of uh, conflicts. You, you have a, a constructive and a destructive uh, conflict. So I'm not arguing that conflict is a bad thing per se. I'm not saying that. Uh, there will always be uh, conflicts amongst uh, political parties because we're talking about people who come from different walks of life with uh, different ideological uh, persuasions and so on. Uh, but the key thing is to make sure that uh, the needs of uh, their constituencies, they come first. Uh, and also not to use uh, these you know, power sharing arrangements as a platform of musical chairs or as a way of exchanging um, positions. Uh, because those things don't benefit uh, the majority. They, they, they only benefit the, the political uh, elite. So all in all, what I'm saying is that the, the, the way out of uh, this uh, missing link uh, between power sharing and, and uh, conflict management is to basically um, see conflict as a win-win uh, situation. And 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 make sure that uh, the the needs of communities uh, are prioritized. Um, thank you, Dr. Breakfast. And for you, um, uh, Solomon. So, in your picture that we are painting on the coalition environment in in Somalia, I got the sense that, and I and I and we battled to hear you clearly. I got the sense that it's a doom and gloom type of picture that you were painting. Now, what I'd like to ask is that, is that in fact the case? Is that the message you're driving? Or are we beginning to see a, 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 some possibilities of either coalitions beginning to work or the political environment changing towards consolidating uh, into a two party or, or, or some clear majorities. Um, it, it, what's your reading in terms of what's the emerging, uh, you know, uh, 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 trend in, in, in coalition politics there? 
And I see we've got a question. I'll, I'll, I'll take that after you've answered. Let's try to address uh, uh, your question. Uh, as you know, uh, in Ethiopia, there are different uh, political parties. Uh, currently, around uh, 100 political parties legally registered and they run for elections. And the most of them, uh, around 90% Ethiopian opposition political parties uh, form a long ethnic lines. This is because of uh, uh, different factors. Is is is, is most of the times is driving by Ethiopian political uh, histories. Uh, anyway, why Ethiopian political parties form the coalitions? There are different factors. One is uh, to to, to uh, combine the resource. Another is to, to get the votes uh, or to, to avoid uh, the wastage of the votes or the vote of the voters during the elections, because. Uh, as already uh, as about mentioned in Ethiopia, there are different political parties. Those political parties established along ethnic lines, and they have different uh, uh, political views or political attitudes. Uh, so those a single political parties, for example, oil if if this oil if is run in your normal regions, it's impossible to establish uh, governments because. Uh, in Ethiopia, it's called the parliamentary systems. Therefore, Ethiopia, the, in, in Ethiopia context, one party is to, to establish uh, the government or, or to, to establish government, it must be secure 50 plus, uh, 50 plus one. Therefore, in Ethiopia, uh, for example, uh, in the Ormian regions, the Ormian region seats is around 178. Uh, one government or one party is to, to, to uh, establish a government at least uh, secure uh, around 2,500, uh, 2,015, or around 50 plus one secure in the parliamentary system. Therefore, uh, one is to, to, to seeking political power. Uh, the Ethiopian opposition parties form party coalitions. Another is uh, to, to, to combine the resource. As you know, Ethiopia is, 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 is a pure uh, country. Uh, in order to compound, uh, compound or to use their resources sufficiently, uh, the parties, political parties, form it a party coalitions. Mainly, those uh, political parties uh, established their own uh, party coalition for those two prominent reasons. Thank you. So it's a pluralist uh, from a from a political competition uh, perspective. So I've got a question for Prof. Njongwana uh, on the Q&A. Uh, does your data note strategies adopted by single, I think you use the term, a different term here, you use the term loan, mothers to challenge or escape the stigma associated with the child support grant? So strategies uh, to, 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 to challenge or escape the stigma associated with the child support grant and ways of asserting their independence and dignity in the face of poverty and need for state support. If you could share some of those, uh, if reflected in your data. Uh, yeah. Then this, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. The, the, sorry, let, 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 me, let me point out that second one from Prof. Namalangam Kize, that first one. Uh, was from Butumelo Matala. Uh, the second one for you, Prof, is um, Prof Jongwana. This is an interesting study. Have you perhaps looked at how restoring a lone mother's sense of dignity impacts her children's sense of dignity? Thanks. If you may, thank Prof. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, with the first um, question uh, in respect of um, stigma and um, independence, there are, there are um, recommendations made from the findings that um, governments ought to, to, to properly train their um, officials to for the Im implementation aspect of their policies to reflect the constitution. So, so if officials could disperse the, the child support grant in a way that does not 
um, stigmatize um, low income people with low income. Um, at Kailicha, uh, for example, um, in order to apply for the for the grant, women would uh, would have to queue up from three a.m. in the morning, um, and still don't get helped um, at, at, at the end of the day. So they do that three or four times until they get the help that they need, and because it's often dark in Cape Town um, at that time, um, their security has been put um, to risk. So that is um evidence given um for um to, to for for um policy implementation to be adjusted in that sense and of course early childhood development centers um for children have been very limited uh, so a lot of women especially in rural areas um so a lot of women are unable to um send their children to early childhood development centers um so that they then would be able to um to go to work because working and looking after children simultaneously as government expects these women to do is is just it's it's impossible um, um i think that the i think prof Kiza's question was um has the study looked at the impact of um loan mother's economic um, status on children. I, I don't know if I understood it uh, correctly. Just to clarify that the reason why I used loan mothers rather than single mothers is because the loan motherhood um, includes um, de facto mothers who are in fact grandmothers. A whole lot um, of them, um, I think 10%, of 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 um lone mothers in south africa are in fact grandmothers so i could we couldn't i couldn't call those single mothers because it just gives a different um view of them so i did do a quite a, a extensive research on uh, on the impact on 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 children um and the impact on mothers of the children's um suffering and found that some mothers leave their children on their own to, to, to look after themselves only because they have to go work. And a lot of these, a lot of women do domestic, um, live in domestic work, raising other people's children whilst their children are being raised by other, by relatives most of the time. And these relatives are, will never replace a mother, um, although um, they may raise them as well as they can. There are definitely instances of um, child abuse uh, or where there are, there are children in that home where uh, um, their mother is present, differential treatment of the children, which, with, with, which then in turn affects the children of the absent um, of the absent mothers. Also, um, some women said that had they been at home raising their children, um, they they would have noticed certain things much earlier, like um, speech impediments, which need to be treated um, at a certain time, or um, if um, you know, a child has some learning disability, which needs to be addressed from an early age, but the, the mother is, because the mother is only there for a short period of time, they're not really able to assess that, that their own children in, in, in that much detail. And of course, the depression that sets in with the mothers that, um, with both mothers and, and children, because of this long term, often long term, unhealthy, um uh, separation um well, there, there was there was a lot of that thank you um thank you doc i've got uh, a lot more questions uh, for oh yeah i've got a question for dr breakfast uh, to prof breakfast is it not rather idealistic to view political conflict as win-win 
and to assume that the political elite will willingly prioritize the interests of the masses, um, especially where the masses are largely impoverished and underprivileged. That's from Agogo. Yeah, so, um, you know, Mr. whether you like it or not, I mean, uh, if you look at the way things are at the moment, in particular in urban centers, you have political fragmentation and lack of uh, majoritarianism, even in our own backyard. It's not quite clear which uh, party is going to win the um, elections at local government level. Uh, so that creates a scope for power sharing or uh, coalition uh, formations. So um, uh, coalitions, whether you like it or not, are a future in this country. Uh, I don't think that it is possible because maybe the, the, the question uh, uh, comes from this notion that politics is about one political party or one political bloc imposing its agenda on all and sundry. Uh, I don't think that is possible um, at the moment. Uh, I think uh, coalition politics uh, have created a scope for power to be uh, diffused. And I'm arguing that in order to make that work, uh, there have to be some compromises which are reached uh, in order for development to be uh, promoted. Otherwise, these coalition uh, formations are going to fall apart and that is going to be counterproductive for uh, development. I know it's a difficult thing, but I think it's, uh, it's possible if the needs of communities are uh, prioritized. Uh, thank you, Dr. Breakfast. Question for Ivan. Your point about the disillusionment with and withdrawal from politics is interesting. Are activists engaged in changing this and how this could be done? How could this be done? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so my, my point with uh, disillusionment is to do with the uncompetitive nature of the election because the elections going on in Uganda, if we look at, um, you know, since 20, 2016 to date have been managed. So people feel like there's no need to participate. Um, there's literally no cause for them to be engaged. Now, what activists are doing, of course, of course, they identify, they use the election to show people that, you know, the regime is doing this and putting you in a position not to act. And them feeling that this is not going to yield they've moved into a direction to to start to show that the regime to high, to make highlights of where the regime is is, is repressive and it, the the shift has been in using monstrations things like um music events um if we have to look at the last election presidential election um They've used music events and festivals to dramatize um, a shift from, you know, looking at the model of electoral process into attracting people to feel engaged that these are people who relate with us, to kind of build that sense of um, that sense of of recognition to form a base from where they can move forward into active involvement in politics. Um, our recent um, opposition figure has been Bobby Wine. And, uh, and of course, when we review, we look at how things look right now, it seems that the opposition has pushed, rather the, the regime has pushed the opposition back to a place where they were. And which comes, of course, to my point that, you know, of course, I'm recognizing that there's been a movement to see that people become active, but suddenly have been placed back where, where they, they started from. I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. 
Um, we got a question for Prof. Njongwana. I suspect this might be the last in this round, but we'll see how, how we are doing with time. Uh, so it's from Dr. Babalo Makokwana. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, I would like to hear your views on the racialized welfare state programs, including the school feeding scheme that were, des de that were designed to deal with white poverty in the 1900s. I am reminded of the social policies that prioritize the citizenship of white children without making provisions for the black children at the time. In the post-apartheid uh, period, do you think we should consider some of these intentional tactics beyond focusing on available employment based on assumptions uh, type of social policy? Great work, thank you. I, I suppose this comment also, you can include it in your response. Uh, does anyone ever ask if black grandmothers are not depressed, tired, struggling with fulfillment, unable to put their needs first, and living more and more in fear of being raped and murdered in their own communities? Comment from uh, Prof. Nomalangam uh, Kize. Okay. Th thank you, colleagues. Um, if I'll start with uh, Dr. Makorkwana's um, um, question and comment. I, I, I definitely agree that um, social sec security provision um, for women with low income should definitely looked at a more comprehensive way of supporting these women rather than expecting them to work and care for their children at the same time. Um, so yeah, the study goes as far as um, the state maintenance grant, um, which was uh, offered during the apartheid era for a number of decades. I, ca I just can't remember off the top of my head um, how, for how many decades, but um, it was um, given to um, white Indian and colored families with um, colored families um, having the highest percentage of, 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 of intake, but definitely available for white and Indian people too, not available for black, um, for black Africans. So definitely um, racially um, stratified. So um, what I do in, in the study is to, so that, that, that state maintenance grant was scraped as soon as, um, you know, at the onset of, of, of de democracy, because there was a cry that when Black African families are included, it, it, the, the, the fiscus won't be able um, to take it. But of course, studies show that um, if, for example, um, the tax benefit system for middle class were to be used um, to used or redistributed in a sense to um, and, and, and channeled to low income family, it could definitely, um, that's just one example that it, it would work. So I hypothetically, um, in the quantitative aspect of, of the study, re the state maintenance grant that was offered during apartheid to all women who um, who need who need it, and I do this by using the the income expenditure survey and the um, general household survey as, as micro um, uh, data. Relate that with the tax um, benefit um, system, and um, this exercise um, showed that poverty in 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 in, in households were headed by women with low income is reduced by 20% um, in the country. So that also sort of reduces inequality um, in the country. Um, the question on grandmothers, um, yes, in, in the study, grandmothers were treated as lone mothers because they are actually, as I, as I said, de facto um, mothers. 
and of course questions of, of both physical and mental um, well-being or lack thereof um, were asked because the yes these de facto mothers receive the child support grant some of them receive the foster care grant which is more than the child support grant um, and they also have to share their old age pension and not address they usually can find it difficult to address um, their own needs in old age and a lot of them often are grieving um, children that they've lost that are parents to to these children and there's a whole cohort of course of um, HIV AIDS um, orphans that these uh, grandmothers or lone mothers um, grieve in many ways. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, your last comments, Prof, 30 seconds uh, to each of the panelist members. I'll start with you, followed by Ivan, Solomon, and then Dr. Breakfast. Oh, um, I think my, my strongest take from this study is that, especially in, 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 in the um, pandemic, is that we, when drawing up policies, we really need to um, consider who, who we are and our ways of being just ontologically also infuse our, our, our ways of being into the policies that we make and not just take, um, you know, Western perspectives Thank when you. drawing up our own policies. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Ivan? Yes, so my my big takeaway here is that as people who advocate for change and to see that there's um, equal participation in government, we need, I feel like there's a need to pay to attention to um, not necessarily the language that um, people we are working with for the struggle use, um, but certainly things that they get us to get involved in. And I think- Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're running out of time. Solomon, 30 seconds, please. I don't see Solomon, Dr. Breakfast, your last comments. Yes, so I think uh, uh, one party dominance uh, clearly is a thing of the past. Um, I expect that uh, in urban centers, all political parties, uh, they will get uh, below 50%. Uh, and I think that will create a scope for um, uh, coalition formations, but they need to be embedded within a conflict management uh, context in order for- Thank you, Doug. Okay. Thank you. Sorry to do that to you. Uh, I don't want to be blamed by the conference organizers uh, for running over time. We've run, we've, we've run out of time. Thank you, colleagues. You've done exceptionally well. I think that this has uh, enhanced our understanding. And remember, it's, and it's in line with the broad theme of the conference. The state we are in, democracies, uh, fr fractures, fixes, and futures. It's been a fantastic time. I'm greatly honored to have been part of this uh, session. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, we, let's, let's continue attending the great presentations in the conference. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, colleagues. That was a wonderful session. Uh, I know we're, uh, our time is very tight, unfortunately. We've got so many papers uh, to to manage here at, at the conference, uh, but we really do appreciate uh, your uh, your time and your effort and and a great uh, engagement. Thank you very much. So for the next session that will start at one o'clock, you will see that we've got parallel sessions running in the main auditorium, which is where you are presently. We will have African politics and black political thought, and then in the chat uh, we will place a link to the breakout room if you want to join panel two on racial dynamics of inclusion and exclusion please click on that link and uh, and you'll be able to to move into the breakout room
uh, to, to attend racial dynamics of inclusion, exclusion. So yeah, please join us at one o'clock for these two uh, panels that both promise to be very interesting.